Well, good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you out to the house of the Lord this morning. I clicked this thing on a while ago and that speaker started squalling. <laughs> I wasn't even saying nothing. <laughs> but uh, I hope y'all, y'all had a good week. Uh, like I say, it is good to be here and uh, good to see y'all out this morning. It's good smiling faces. Uh, and uh, good to be here this morning. Amen. It's good to be here. I tell you, it's good to be saved. Uh, you know, we... Uh, uh, Amidst all what's going on in this world, uh, like Keith's talking about all this craziness and stuff, evil stuff going on in this world, the one thing we definitely got to look look to, that's our salvation. Amen. You know, I'm thankful for that. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, this morning, uh, before we get started, we got just a couple announcements, not many, but uh, I'd like to ask, does anyone have any special prayer requests this morning? Amen. Remember these requests. This church, uh, Miss Marie, would you pray? this. Any others? If not, by uplifted hand. I know we still have many. Uh, can you remember our elders there, the ones that's not able to be here with us? Uh, we have many. But uh, at uh, this time, I'd like to ask uh, Brother Nick, uh, if you would, uh, lead us to pray. <coughs> Thank you, Brother Nick. <clears throat> this, uh, just a couple quick announcements here. I've got, uh, I've got one letter right here uh, that sent to us here that, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we voted on there a while back. We sent uh, some money there to Samaritan's Purse to, uh, to uh, help out with the uh, effort there in Ukraine. And uh, we have a letter here that says, Dear friends, thank you for your gift to the ministry of Samaritan's Purse. Our teams are on the ground in Eastern Europe uh, caring for the suffering as war rages in Ukraine. Uh, Samaritan's Purse is meeting the emergency needs of refugees working in Jesus' name to care for women and children who have fled from the, fled from the fighting. Um, we set up our emergency field hospital in, I think, Aviv, as well as other outpatient medical facilities in Ukraine to care for patients who were unable to leave the country. We, will work, we are working uh, with a network of local churches to minister to, to hurting people. I am grateful for your support, which equips Samaritan's Purse to care for victims of war and disaster, uh, reach families in poverty, provide medical care, deliver shoebox gifts, and meet other needs in over 100 countries. And since in everything we do, we proclaim the gospel, obeying uh, Jesus' command. And uh, sincerely, as uh, Franklin Graham there. So uh, let's do continue to pray, uh, pray for the ones that are in this. Uh, it seems like it's not really letting up much. It's been going on and going on. But uh, we'll just continue to pray for all those that are suffering there. So uh, <clears throat> um, also just a uh, couple reminders uh, tonight. Don't forget our service tonight. Uh, we'll start at 6 o'clock. 
and uh, we'll be having deacons meeting at five and we'll be having our business meeting uh, immediately after uh, service tonight um, and don't forget uh, Wednesday night Bible study and we have classes there for uh, children's and teens and adults there so don't forget that and uh, next Sunday uh, is Mother's Day and uh, please don't forget that <laughs> uh, we uh, but now just please uh, we got Mother's Day coming up there and uh, very special time there, um, and it says right here that uh, we need all the kids to meet in the fellowship hall at 9.30 a.m., so uh, don't forget this. And uh, ladies' circle meeting come up, coming up at 7 o'clock, May the 10th, and also May the 15th, their homecoming. Uh, be a covered dish luncheon following the, uh, the worship service that day, so just don't forget their homecoming coming up there. And, uh, of course, our next uh, food bank there is coming up May the 21st. Uh, any paper towels and uh, beef stew there, so uh, continue to remember this here. So don't forget these uh, announcements here. And just hang on to your bulletins there, and uh, we'll keep up. we got to we'll have a busy summer coming up there. So, uh, but, uh, Is there any other thing that I've left out? Any other announcement? Not? All right. Well, if not, then uh, let's all get a book and... Turn to page 333, page 333, and let's all stand. I'll fly away.
God is good. Amen. I'm What it's been such a blessing to have our choir and have our singing back in and incorporated into the service. And you know, he tells us to pr uh, come before his presence with singing, and boy, it just does my heart good to hear that. We're going to hear some more. Brother Jonathan is going to come and mind the Lord and sing, and uh, we're just so excited to have you in the house of God and all those that may be joining us. And uh, we've got some that's uh, not with us this morning physically, but they are maybe joining us by the way of internet. They some on vacation. They some uh, and uh, sickness and things like that, and uh, some may be visiting from all across the country. We welcome you, uh, but we welcome you into the presence of the Holy Spirit because He will take and, and has presence over the service here today. We need His instruction. We need His guidance. We need His help, and uh, He's welcome here. And uh, we're so thankful that you're here and uh, you pray for us. And uh, Brother Jonathan, like I said, be coming. And uh, we're excited uh, about that. We're looking, always look forward to him, hearing him sing and appreciate, again, our choir. Just a wonderful job. I did hear a lot of good singing behind me whenever I was up here. And it sounds like maybe some more back here need to be up here, all right? And I hadn't talked with Bobby. I just want to spring this on since the men got broke in that last song pretty good. Uh, listen, why don't we do this, all right? Mother's Day is ne next Sunday. How about all the men plan on coming and singing for uh, the last song there and singing for all the ladies? Would that be okay? Everybody, all right, let's do that, all right? Now, uh, here, here at Oak Level, we know the difference between a man and a woman, all right? So we'll, we'll call you out if you sit back there. <laughs> We'll call, we'll call you out if you're sitting back there next Sunday morning, all right? Uh, so uh, you pray for Brother Jonathan. He comes and sings and minds the Lord, Brother John. It's hard to follow that. <laughs> Kind of hard to bring it back down, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I'm always thankful to have opportunity to stand up here and try, and try to sing. Uh, not sure uh, the song was, was on my mind. Uh, just hadn't planned on singing, but uh, God has God has plans. Uh, this could be for anyone. It could just be for me, uh, you know. But um, the song is uh, the potter knows the clay, but I know a lot of times we we struggle through situations that sometimes we don't always talk about. We don't always bring the light, but uh, even internal struggles, God knows about them, and and He knows how much we can take. And um, I'm thankful that I've got a Savior that that loves me enough to to know me for who I am, uh, to understand when I need help, uh, whether I ask for it or whether I don't. He's there for me. The Holy Spirit is always there to comfort, and uh, I'm just thankful that that uh, I can I can stand here and say that that I've got a God that, that loves me enough to know me for who I am, uh, and know how much I can take. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I know you're going through the fire. It's getting hard to stand up here. Leaving harder is the wondering Is God's hand still on me? It's lonely in the flames When you're counting all the days of pain But the potter knows and how much pressure it can take How many times around the wheel Till there's submission to His will He's planned a beautiful Some 
fire and time it's gonna be just came through the fire not too very long ago and looking back I can't see why and that my God was in control days I'd cry Oh Lord Isn't it about time But the potter knows the clay And how much pressure it can take How many times around the wheel Submission to His will. He's planned a beautiful design, but it'll take some fire and time. Oh, it's gonna be okay. Cause the potter. Joshua chapter number 3 this morning. Joshua chapter number 3, and I'm so thankful that, that God, God knows us, and this is, this is the part that's hard for me to believe. He knows us, but yet He still loves us. Amen. He loves us, and He's got to work for us. He's got to, His will is perfect for our lives, and and I'm sure like a lot of you, we've uh, made decisions that's brought us to places in our life. We're wondering how in the world did we ever get in this condition or get in this situation. Um, you know, it's amazing sometimes we can read in, in the annuals of our, our graduating classes all the dreams and the hopes and ideas of where you think you'll be in 10 years. And ain't it amazing? I, I don't know if there's anybody that can say I'm where... I expected to be or I had planned to be whenever I was 18. I, I, I didn't realize that life would take me through the circumstances. I didn't realize what it meant whenever Jesus told Peter, Satan the th desires to have you to sift you as sweet. You don't, you don't n know what Satan's sifter was, but now God has brought you through that or maybe Today you're going through that and you don't realize and understand how you're going to make it through. I liken it to this, this walk and this life. You know, the Bible tells us that uh, this life is but a vapor. We're here for a little while. Uh, and that, that God, for a righteous man, God orders and guides and leads him and orders his steps. But sometimes, Brother Seth, we make decisions, don't we? And I do. We all do. And it gets us off of that path. Um, you know, there was, uh, there was uh, two boxers as it was getting ready to fight one time. And, and I remember they was in, the reporter was interviewing the two fighters. And they had just got done interviewing uh, uh, one of the fighters. And he goes, uh, the reporter goes there and puts it in front of another fighter and says, 
uh, your, your partner over here that you're getting ready to fight with said that he had a, a plan. And that fighter says, well, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And, you know, that's, that's comical, but yet it's true. It's true because life deals us those punches, doesn't they? Life and decisions, there, it, it deals those punches. And today is no different, Brother Rex. We look around and we see perilous times. We see wars and rumors of wars. We see pestilences. We see in wickedness. We see in a great falling away. We see people heaping themselves teachers, having itching ears. We see people trying to establish their own righteousness. And what more do you have to do to look around and read in the Word of God to understand that the Word of God is our truth. Amen. The Word of God is true. And here in Joshua chapter number 3 is no different uh, I know that it's a length of reading, but I promise you we will not take but just a few thoughts out of the first four or five verses, but I, I, I want to make sure that we have the context and rightly divide the word of truth. Now, the passage of Scripture that we're going to read this morning is 17 verses, uh, but it's, it's brought us to a point that the, the children of Israel has... Uh, been led out of uh, uh, out of Egypt. You remember that. And uh, if you're not here on Wednesday night, I want to encourage you, if any way possible, get involved in Wednesday night. We're watching the building of the children of Israel, and we'll see this as we go through Exodus, and we see these things taking place. But here we know that God has raised up a man by the name of Moses, and heard heard the cry of the children. Raised up Moses. Moses led them out into the wilderness. The Bible says there that uh, things had happened. They wandered in the wilderness 40 years. And that generation passed away and it come time. Uh, now's the time to go into the promised land. The land where that you've heard about it from your grandmas and grandpas. The, the promise that God, God, God gave to your great, great, great grandfather Abraham and passed it down through Isaac and through Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Now that, that promise of the promised land is before you. And, and God so, tells Joshua to prepare the people and we'll pass over Jordan, over the river Jordan, into the promised land. Well, I got to thinking about all those things, child of God, listen, that they faced and as they was wandering in the wilderness and all the circumstances and all the trials and what it must have been to know that this was the last mile of the way just before passing over into the promised land. We want to read the first 17 or the 17 verses of chapter number 3. The Bible says in Joshua rose early in the morning and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do, will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant, and pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant, and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that He will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergesites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you 
Twelve men out of the twi- tribes of Israel, out of every, man, uh, every, every tribe a man. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord, God, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of all Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand up upon a heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the Lord. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overflowed all his banks, all the time of harvest, that tears, tears down a lot of modern understanding of where the Jordan was and that it was not a dry time, but it was a very, very wet time to where the Jordan was flooding. Picking up verse number 16, Then the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zertan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. The Heavenly Father, we love you with all of our heart. God, we thank you for what's already been accomplished here today. Lord, I thank you for the, the spirit of peace. God, how it moves in about the camp. God, I know to Heavenly Father that same Spirit that can bring peace, can bring conviction, can bring understanding, and can bring discernment. And God, I pray to Heavenly Father that the presence of the Holy Spirit would be thick in this place to accomplish a work in every heart and every life. For truly, we're a needy people, God. But Lord, I understand that, God, all of our needs sometimes are different. And Lord, I pray for strength for the weak, for wisdom, for those that desire to know knowledge. God, I pray, Lord, for, for understanding for those that are confused. And Lord, I pray to Heavenly Father, most of all, for salvation to that one that is lost. Lord, I, God, may they see themselves wandering in that wilderness of sin. And God, they have no direction. God, they don't know which way to go. But God, I pray today, and Lord, they'd realize that they need to fasten their eyes on Christ. God, they need to look to you for their understanding and for their leadership. And God, you'll take them places that they've never been before. And God, will give you the praise for what you do in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate your prayers and I ask you to continue to pray for us through this message. And, and I appreciate your, your listening and your understanding of the Word of God. For truly, uh, well, there's a lot to cover in this passage of Scripture. But I, I just want to stay close in the first five verses and, Uh, Let's read the first verse again. The Bible says, And Joshua rose up early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. Uh, That city, Shittim, and my understanding is about 12 miles in uh, east of the Jordan River before crossing over into Canaan's land. And it's in a portion of, of what is referred to oftentimes as the wilderness of sin. Uh, we, we got to understand before we can understand where they are going, we got to understand where the children of Israel is at. Uh, and it's very applicable to our life. Before we can ever uh, decide where we need to go or what we need to do, we first have to take a look and understand where are we at. And, and here the children of Israel was in a place called the wilderness, the wilderness of, of sin. And uh, uh, why was they there? And a lot of people would think that, the, that God had caused the, the children of Israel uh, to wander for 40 years just to teach them lessons and show them about things in life. But you know what? That's not what God's intention was to begin with. If you'll understand and look back over in Numbers chapter number 13 and 14 that God had uh, encouraged and told uh, Moses to choose 12, one out of every tribe to go out to spy the land of Canaan. Do you remember that? Uh, Joshua and Caleb was two of those spies and they went over there into Canaan's land to spy out uh, the enemy to, to check and see how things uh, were going and 
uh, ten of those uh, spies, whenever they come back, they said, you're not going to believe. Uh, it's true, that land flows with milk and honey. Uh, they've, got, uh, they've got brought uh, even a great cluster back that was so big that they had to carry it uh, between two men. And that's some big grapes, amen. I can see, some, where is that commercial? You pop a straw in that grape right there and just uh, drink till your heart is content. Uh, what, what was waiting on them on the other side? Just on the other side of Jordan, what was waiting on the children of Israel? Uh, but 10 of those men uh, that were spies, uh, they said, but look, uh, said they've giants, they're, uh, they're ch children of Anak in that land, the Amalekites, and they are, they're fortified, they've got walls, and uh, we were as grasshoppers in their sight. Do not go up against them, we cannot win. But there was two men, Joshua and Caleb, that stood up and said, listen, he said, let's go and let's go at once. Uh, God has told us uh, and made us a promise that uh, every one of the enemies will fall upon in our hands. And, uh, we will take this land when this is our home. But yet the Bible says they hearken to the other ten. And it awful whenever it seems like that the, uh, that the people follow the majority's consensus even though it goes against the word of God and goes against the will of God. And I don't know how long, but I know it wasn't 40 years. I, I believe it was just a short period of time that God was bringing them across the wilderness that they sent those spies out of the first spies out and the ten come back. But what did they choose? They chose to believe fear. They chose to believe other man's opinion and still instead of believing the word of God. God's anger was kindled up even to the point he was going to wipe that generation off the face of the earth. But God heeded and heard the prayer of Moses. But you know what? The consequence of their disbelief and the consequence of this, their disobedience was that no one in that generation other than the two that believed God, Joshua and Caleb, was to ever cross over into the promised land. Actually, the other ten, if you'll read it, God caused the plague to come and kill those other ten spies for what they'd done in misleading God's people. But the Bible, this is why they were wandering in the wilderness of sin. God did not intend for them initially to wander for 40 years. It was their own decisions because they made the decision to listen to man instead of trusting God. They made the decision to lean towards fear instead of courage and trust in the Word of God. And because of their disobedience and unbelief, God said no one in this generation will cross over into the promised land. So they wandered in the wilderness until the passing away of that generation, a new generation was born. And the Bible said they were to pass over into the promised land. In chapter number 3, we, we read there in chapter number 2 uh, where they sent uh, two spies out. Do you remember that? And they, they went to a, a lady's house by the name of Rahab, the harlot Rahab. And there she, they said, look, she, she told the, the, the spies, said, look, said, we fear, we tremble. The whole, the whole community trembles because they know uh, that we have been delivered into your hand, that God is the, the true God. So the spies went back, told them, said, look, uh, everything's ready. We, we're going into the promised land. And, uh, but, but first of all, we got to understand, why are we wandering? Amen. That, that's what I want to say. We're, we're just like the children of Israel. Amen. A lost, if you're here today and you're lost and undone without Jesus Christ, I want you to know you're in your own wilderness of sin. It's not just a coincidence that it's called the wilderness of sin. But I want you to understand something. It's never been God's, God's intention that you continually wander in that situation year after year. What causes us to continually wandering and wandering around and around in confusion? It's because of our disobedience and our unbelief just like the children of Israel but we must read on the Bible says uh, we see there in verse number 1 Joshua rose up and said let's go that's 12 miles about what you can travel in a day the Bible says they come from uh, Shittim and lodged there just on the east side 
of Jordan, okay? And they're just right there uh, getting ready to, to cross over. They're just to the east. Whenever I make reference, Jordan, it's to the east of Jordan, okay? Uh, so they're, they're, uh, they're there. Uh, they've traveled a day's journey. They're just right before crossing over. And we see verse number two. The Bible says, And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people saying, watch this, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priest of the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. What's God's word saying right here? To the children of Israel, Joshua is saying, look, do you do all remember what the covenant, the ark of the covenant is? Do you remember we, we had a study there on Wednesday night on, on the tabernacle? And that is a, a, a tent uh, form of the temple, if you will. And they, they would set that up as they were moving through the wilderness. Um, whenever God said to stay here, they would set that tent up. Uh, there, there was a, the outer courts, there was the holy place, and then there were the most holy place. Do you remember that? And inside the holiest of holies, the most holy place, that was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that was somewhere around the dimensions of uh, two and a quarter. I believe it was two and a quarter by two and a quarter uh, width and height. And yet it was three and three quarters feet long. So it was a box uh, in, in a, a treasure chest that was overlaid with gold. All right. Uh, and inside, uh, do you remember what that was on the inside that was kept on the inside of the ark of God? Uh, do you remember that was the, the tablets of the Ten Commandments? You remember that? Also, there was a jar of manna, right? And there was also the, the, the rod of Aaron that budded that was kept inside of that. But in, most importantly, what did it represent? The ark of God represents the presence of God. No man could come close to that nor touch it unless you die. There was only one time uh, that, and then they didn't, they didn't carry that out uh, without all the, all the drapings over that. Uh, no man could, this one time a year, could the high priest alone go into the holiest of holies and offer, uh, offer up on the day of atonement a blood sacrifice for all those uh, people in the, in the, in the, ta in the camp, right? Uh, so we see uh, the presence of God is represented in the ark of God. Joshua come to them and said, right here, this is what's going to happen. After three days, he said, whenever you see the Levites bearing the ark of God and they're walking uh, to, the, to the Jordan River, then you get up and follow it. If I could say there just for a minute, what was Joshua saying? I know that you want to cross that river. I know that you want to go to your place that you've been hearing about. I want, I want you to know that I understand it's hard for you to sit here seeing that Canaan land is just in sight and you not get up and go on your own. But Joshua said, what I want you to do and what you have to do, you got to wait on the move of God and that you'd be able to follow God in His direction, amen? Because He'll prepare the way. Uh, how many times uh, uh, we, we, we've been wondering, we'll be in a problem we don't understand. We pray and ask God's direction. You see God start to work in your life and you see things start lining up and you see things start falling in order and then what happens? The inner man starts taking over and said, you know what? I've got it from here on. Uh, God, I don't need you. Everything's going right now and I'll take it from here uh, you just go back and you stay out of the way and I'll fix it. Amen. Joshua said you do not do that. You, if you do not move, you stay right where you at until you see the move of God. How many times in my life, Keith, if I'd have taken that own advice, my own advice right there, and I would have heeded and not moved out of self of what I thought I needed to do and waited on the move of God. Really, you know, I, I, I believe with all my heart God will honor that intent of the heart, that you're making sure that that's God's will for your life. Don't, don't ever feel like you have to be in a rush and have to be in a hurry whenever you're seeking from the will of God. Sometimes it's hard to know, isn't it? Sometimes you pray and it's hard to hear and hard to understand. 
But you keep checking up and making sure the intent of your heart is to follow the will of God. And I promise you this, God will send His presence before you. And if you'll fall right in line of Him, God, you know what the Bible says over there in Psalm 99? That He sitteth between the cherubims. Well, what a, what a mighty picture of that is, that the ark of God. Uh, we see that uh, there was rings on the corners where 15 foot rods was uh, put through there, Jack. Uh, the Levites was on the corners and they would bear that ark up and carry it. They wanted to touch it, but they were to bear it. They would bear it by the poles. And uh, on the top of that chest is two cherubims. And uh, they've got their wings uh, coming forward and touching one another. And right in the center of those wings, uh, that's where that the, the holy, in the holiest of holies, the high priest would come and sprinkle that blood. That was called the mercy seat. Amen. And you know what? The Bible says that, that God's presence, He resided right there uh, between the two cherubim. So it was important for the children of Israel not to move until they seen the ark of God, God's presence, uh, presence leading them. That's very true. Now I can't stress that enough. And God opened my heart up to this, that oftentimes in our knowledge and our wisdom we become as fools and we move without the direction of God. If God is not leading, if God is not telling you, the, you say, preacher, how do I know? The very first place you need to look, whether or not the decision you make is honoring God is in the Word of God. Okay, a lot of people is waiting on an audible voice or something to tell them the direction in their life. I want you to know that God has already given us instruction in His Word. Those things that were represented in the ark of God, including the Ten Commandments, it's still the Ten Commandments today. It's not limited to that, but it's a really good place to start. Amen. If we start looking at the Ten Commandments, we feel like or we realize and understand that we all fall short. Amen. We all need instruction in our life. Uh, but God has given us the instructions. God has told us what to do. If there's any decision in your life that goes against the Word of God and what He's already told you to do, that is enough. You need to understand you need to flee from that situation and turn from that and turn to God. Don't wait. God's not going to come with a stick and thump you on top of the head. If He's already told you in His Word that it goes against God, don't, vet, don't wait and think that God is going to change His mind. If you're going to sin if you're going to go against God, you go ahead and do that, but understand you'll be wandering in a wilderness of sin until you bow down and cry out to God and God sends the Holy Spirit to you to rebuke and to chastise you and bring you back to God. Amen. Chastisement, well, it's not fun, but it's a sure acknowledgement of whose child you are. Amen. Uh, he said, those that I love, I rebuke and chasten. One thing I have found out, that there's internal chastisement, there's external chastisement, and there's eternal chastisement. And it would do us all good to understand if we'll heed the chastisement of the first one, which is an internal chastisement. Do you know what that is? That's whenever God the Holy Spirit reminds you of His Word. What God's already done for you of His truth. He tells you and convicts your heart. And inside your heart, you know where you're going is wrong. You know who you've been talking to is wrong. You know those texts that you've been seeing. You know those websites that you've been visiting. You know those places that you've been going on Saturday night. The things that you've been doing with somebody that's not your husband or wife. You know that it's wrong inside your heart. I bet you'll not do anything about it. But you just rest assured. You rest assured if you will the internal chastising of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God in your life. God will take it to the next step. You ever done? You ever seen that, that look from Daddy, huh? And the church that look from Mama. Whenever she, you you've been a little bit too loud, and she looks over there. Amen. You better heed that look because you know what's going to happen whenever you get home. A lot of those mamas from churches of yesteryear didn't wait till they got home. A lot of them got it right there in the bench. <laughs> Amen. A lot of them brought their hickory tea with them. Amen. The house of God. But you know what? If we don't heed that internal chastisement, 
you can bet this is going to happen. There's going to be external punishment that happens in your life. That's very scary. Because God is a God of all. He, he has a, a, a will that He would have for your life, but He also has a permissive will. And don't misunderstand that. That means that there's things that happen in your life that nothing happens in your life without God allowing it to happen. Okay? I want you to know He is, a lot of people don't want to view Him as a just and a righteous and a wrathful and a vengeful God. But I'm going to tell you, the God of the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. The difference he is, 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 the, is the difference in it all. And that's the way, the truth, and the life. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have a way of escape. Oh my, God, I could spend time in. Listen, the wilderness of sin, you're wandering in that. As, as Brother John sung about, you're on, the, you're on the wheel of a potter. Man, as you're spinning around as that clay, that don't seem like it's making any sense. And all you're doing is getting dizzier and dizzier and more confused and more confused to the point you can't see God's hand in it. And we don't understand what God's doing. What God's doing is breaking you down and bringing you a place with external chastisement. And because we didn't listen to the internal chastisement he wants to make you into a vessel that's fit for the master's use because he's got a place at his table one day we're going to reside amen amen thank God he's still working on us but you know why the people won't listen to the internal external there's an internal punishment you know the Bible speaks of even in 1 Corinthians a people that would not reverence him whenever they took the Lord's Supper they did not reverence that. Many that were sick, many that were buried and dead because of that, because of their irreverence. Don't think that God cannot put you in an early grave because you continually be disobedient to the Father. Truly He will. I've experienced that. I've seen that with loved ones. I've seen that in my life to where God knows the decisions that you're going to make. If you're going to continually turn to sin and not turn to God, I believe as a good father, as a good father, He would rather you be with Him than continue to to hurt yourself, continue to bring shame on the name of Christ, and continue to harm those around you. Because I'm going to tell you, God has not called us to be like the world. God has called us out from the world. He said, be ye separate, saith the Lord. The problem is that we look no different than those that are wandering in sin. We dress like the world, we act like the world. We look like the world. We walk like the world. We talk like the world. We go to the same places that the world goes except for three hours on Sunday morning. We come into the house of God and think everything's going to be made right. And God don't work like that. God's first or He's not at all. And listen, I don't know. Even a good thing, please hear me. Even a good thing that you put before God is a bad thing and it's sin whenever it comes between you and the will of God for your life. Remember, the guideline is not my preaching. It is the Word of God, okay? It's the Word of God. And we must read on. The Bible says in verse number 3, watch this, and He commanded the people saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priest of Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Watch this. We'll close with this thought. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the, the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way heretofore. Now, what, what's Joshua telling them? He said, look, said, I, you don't need to come near to the Ark of the Covenant. You remember we established this is the presence of God. This is the direction of God because the ark and the Levites bearing it are going to go the way the Lord has led them and you are to follow. But here's the kick. You're not to get close to the ark. You're to stay 2,000 cubits away. And if you do some reading and studying on 2,000 cubits, that's actually the distance that a person was allowed or a Jew was allowed to travel on the Sabbath day. Actually, they established the city limits 
by the using the 2,000 cubits mark. So God's Word's just tied all together. Well, my understanding in the best way of my Wilkes County math, that's .57, just a little over a half a mile. Just a little over a half a mile. And you think about why is it, watch this, why is it that God told Joshua to tell them, don't anybody come near it. I want all of you, the whole congregation, millions, I want you to stand back a half a mile from the ark of God. God showed this to me several years back. You know, you know my understanding of why, not only to protect them from getting close to the ark, I believe the greater purpose was this. If you're following somebody and, or something and the crowd is up close to them, who can see, all right, just say if the ark was just a few, few feet in front of the very first people. And the whole, a million people was going to be following that ark. How many people would really have their eyes on the ark? It'd be just those up front, right? But God said, I want no one to be within a half a mile, over a half a mile away from the ark. Child of God, this is going to come more important in the days ahead. I don't know what tomorrow holds. Neither do you. Like I said, we can make our plans, and I think you ought to be smart and wise, but understand that God is the one in control. But one thing's for certain, this world is going to wax worse and worse. It may get to the time, listen, whenever people are trying to keep you from assembling together in the house of God. When you've got a preacher that will make comments like I made earlier, they're going to look for reasons to get you out of the house of God. That you're not, they'll label that hate speech, and that's not what it is. That's, that's quoting and telling you what Genesis chapter number 1 and 2 and 3 says. Amen? It's as simple as that. But the problem is not with me and with you. Their problem is with God. It always has been. And the devil is, is raging and is waging war. But hear me. Listen, the reason why he said stay back over a half a mile was not that's the first ones, not the priest, not Aaron, not Moses. And excuse me, Moses didn't get to go. Uh, but Joshua, uh, Joshua was not the only ones that could see. With that great distance between that, that's, that's why you've got stadiums that's built up with high seats and so far away that everybody in that congregation could fasten their eyes on the ark. I want you to understand this. I don't care how much confidence, and it's, it's a shame, and you ought to have some confidence in a preacher. You ought to have confidence in your teachers, your deacons. But I promise you this. It's, you, can, you can get in behind them, all right? And do you notice that? I mean, you, just like in a church, in the, the divine order of the church, we got the, the great high priest, the, our, our chief shepherd, our Lord Jesus. He's the one. He's the one leading Oak Level. Don't ever, don't ever think that, that there's a group of people, there's one individual, or there's deacons, or anybody, or a little clique that's ruling and directing the church. Absolutely not. As long as we're here, the one directing is going to be the high priest, he's going to be the chief shepherd, the cornerstone, and we're going to fall in line behind him. Do you know what happens then? The pastor ought to be there right with his eyes on Jesus. Amen. Do you know the thing about it with the deacons and the workers and the leaders in the church? Do you know you can have your eye on your deacons, you can have your eye on your pastor, you can have your eye on your children, and still be focused on Jesus. If you've got them the right distance, and everybody in the right place, amen. Here's the challenge this morning. Where's Jesus at in your life, amen? Are you focusing on Jesus? Have you got your eyes on Jesus? 2,000 cubits, a little over a half a mile, so everybody could see the ark. How about you? Have you went ahead? Are you afraid to go? Are you afraid to make a decision? We'll continue to wander in that wilderness of sin. Well, there's coming a day. You know what's going to happen? Our Lord Jesus Christ is going to come and get His church. He's going to say it's time to go home. And then we'll cross over the spiritual Jordan. Amen. We'll cross over that river. Death will come to this body either, either from the grave or it'll be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye to be like the Son of God. One or the other is going to happen. Hey man, if you're here at Christ's coming. But notice He must be in front of you. He must be your focus. 
and he has to be your confidence. He has to be your confidence. Keep him first in your life. He loves you. He wants to lead and he wants to guide. But he's not going to force himself on you. As long as you continue to think you know, and I know the best way to go, we're going to be wandering around in the wilderness of sin. But there's only one way of escape. For a child of God, his name is Jesus Christ. He's not only the way, the truth, and the life, but he's eternal life, amen, eternal life. One day, whenever we cross over in the promise, I just could you imagine what it must have been like whenever the first spies come back and told about, yes, it's land flowing with milk and honey. Hey, there's trees up there that's bearing fruit you can't believe. Look at these grapes right here. After you get the pulp out and you eat that, you can wear that whole like a motorcycle helmet. Man, it's amazing what's over there. But just because there was some that said, look, we can't do it. And fear come over. Discouragement brought disobedience. They turned and went their own way. And because of that, they were unable to go into Jordan. Let me ask you this. What's keeping you? What's keeping you from following Jesus? Keeping your eyes on Jesus and the blessed hope of His soon returning and that there is a place that He's went away to prepare for you. He said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I, tr- I close my eyes at night here, but I've been dreaming a lot lately for some reason. I don't know what's going on. I, I've probably been eating the wrong things, but I don't, I don't claim to be super spiritual. I think it has more to do with spaghetti. <laughs> but, but, you know, I sit and think and ponder sometimes in the study, and I just, brother, I don't understand a lot about that. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't, I don't understand a lot about God's Word, but it don't keep me from loving it. You know, I think He, 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 he limits me a lot of times to, to keep me in a place to where that I'm humble and I have to trust Him, and I don't—I'm not proud and humble in this, but I know sometimes just sitting in the study, I'll take the Bible and I'll lean back, and I'll put it up there and I hold it to my heart, and uh, and long for a place that I'll call home. And the reason why is because of the hurt and the discouragement that I see in our in my own family's life, but in, in our church and in this world. I enjoy my life. I enjoy the time with my children. I'm looking forward to Walker. Looking forward to Jarrett. Amen. Looking forward to Miss Sassy back there. Amen. But I'm telling you, the more I see, the more we go through, the more I long for home. But I promise you this, the only way you're going to make it, amen, is through Jesus Christ. The only way you'll ever see the promised land, you ever see what's on the other side of Jordan as a child of God, is through and by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, but rest assured, it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Whenever we stand before God, the blood is, only, is going to be the only difference. I love you, and I'd invite you to stand. If God's dealt with your heart, we're going to get a song of invitation. I ask you to come.